Please give Mr. Purcell a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Tonight, this afternoon, we're going to talk about Syria. I've titled it, The 21st Century's Worst Humanitarian Crisis, Escaping Syria. Let's look at Syria before the crisis. We're going to explore what took Syria from a modern, middle-income country in a war-ravaged basket case, and what, if anything, can be done to correct it. Let's look at Syria before the war. Here's their population. You'll see these are all the characteristics of a modern country. I've played a very unique role in its, uh, in its part of the world. I had the privilege of uh, working in the State Department as the head of the refugee program to be the major U.S. contact with the U.N. Uh, Organization for Palestinian Refugees. So I had many contacts uh, with Palestinians in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, the West Bank, and Gaza. So I'd known Syria from a previous uh, contact. Then came the Arab Spring. Within a short time, Libya was engaged in a vicious civil war. In Iraq, the Shiite Prime Minister turned the U.S. trained armed forces into a sectarian militia. That gave space and impetus for radical Sunnis to be reborn as the Islamic State. Before long, ISIS emerged in a deadly way in both Iraq and Syria. Unthinkable consequences followed, including a wider war spilling across borders as radical jihadists established the kind of faux state that Al-Qaeda was never able to achieve fleeing the Assad regime's brutal brutalities, millions of refugees destabilized Syria, its neighbors, and Europe. But the worst case was Syria. Let's look at Syria and its neighbors. As in all refugee crises, when the government support system collapses, protection is denied, security is denied, refugees flee. So from Syria, here's where they went. And we notice the bigger, the yellow, let's stay there for a minute. The bigger the yellow circle, uh, the more refugees they have. So you can see the biggest country is Turkey. Then we got Lebanon, then we got Jordan, we got some in Iraq, we got some in Egypt. But that's the, and we, in refugee work, we always look for a safe asylum zone for refugees to leave. Now let's go to the next. These are the migrant routes they took. You can see here coming from, from uh, the Arab world, going, trying to reach uh, Europe. These blue arrows show the ways, also coming from uh, North Africa. Let's look at the next one. These were the boat routes that they took. And you can see coming here, heading toward uh, both Italy and Greece. These were the escape routes, and I'm sure you've seen on television many scenes from these uh, tragedies that occurred uh, from those areas. The problems in Syria and the Mediterranean did not occur without warning. The, serious, the Syrian tragedy has worsened year by year for the past five years, and early warnings have been ignored. Here's one of them, Julie Smith, who was a national security advisor to Vice, President, uh, to Vice President Biden, 2012 and 13. Here's what Julie said. It was hard for us in 2011, 2012, to look this far out and imagine how bad this could actually get. We allowed that optimism that Bashar would fall and the rebels would win to color our policy decisions. Here's another. This was Mort Abramowitz, uh, when I started the refugee program in 1979, Mort was the U.S. ambassador in Thailand, which was the main asylum country for Indo-Chinese refugees. Mort is legendary in the Foreign Service. Um, he warned of deadly results if the international community 
especially America, remain strikingly detached from the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Syria. Unlike previous American leadership to relieve massive suffering in places like Cambodia, where Martin and I worked, uh, and Rwanda, Ambassador Bramowitz claimed that the American public and the government have been complacent and silent about the Syrian tragedy. Here's another early warning. A year and a half later, in April 2015, Valerie Amos, Valerie Amos you can see over on the right, who is the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and also the UN's Emergency Relief Coordinator. She raised a chilling question. Does anybody care about Syria? During visits to Syria, she said that she had often been asked, why has the world abandoned us? Why does nobody care? These questions were not directed, she said, at the humanitarian agencies, but at the, at the permanent members of the UN Security Council. Morta Bramowitz and Valerie Amos are savvy humanitarians who concluded that action at the political level, placing victims at the center of US foreign policy decision making has been missing. And its absence has blocked the path to a humanitarian solution. Their warnings were ignored. It's important to recognize that Syria is only a part of a larger global humanitarian dilemma. The failure is first and foremost one of diplomacy. That sad commentary came from one of the world's leading humanitarians, Antonio Guterres, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. He made that statement in mid-2015. He was referring to political leaders who failed to take early steps to protect conflict victims when they had the chance. And because of that failure, put millions of lives at risk as the world faced the worst humanitarian crisis we have seen since Vietnam. The UN High Commissioner was revealing what in all likelihood was just the first signs of a shaking, magnetizing volcano. The UN had reported in June 2015 that a global exodus of refugees, asylum seekers, and forced movements of people within country was underway and rising to epic proportions. Only a year after these escalating population movements surpassed 50 million in 2013, which you can see on this chart, for the first time since World War II, they broke records when they surged an additional 20% in 2014 to 60 million, the far right hand column. The rapidly escalating figures reflect a world of renewed and rising conflict with wars. At least 15 have been have were erupted or reignited in the past five years. Wars in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Europe, driving many families and individuals from their homes. Key multilateral officials were deeply concerned that systems for managing those flows were breaking down with countries and aid agencies unable to handle the strain. As an average of nearly 45,000 people a day joined the ranks of those either on the move or stranded far from their home. Back in Syria and the Middle East, it was not surprising that human displacements started to overflow into Europe. I was saddened by the Sunday Washington Post headlines on August 30th, 2015, reporting on twin humanitarian tragedies gripping the world's conscience and crying out for action. The, Euro the uh, European asylum seeker and the Mediterranean boat people crises had merged and caught governments unprepared. 
The twin tragedies that day involved 71 asylum seekers who suffocated in the back of a truck trying to reach Austria and 117 boat people drowning off the Mediterranean coast of Libya. Asyl and you can see here the chart, asylum seekers. These are the main countries they were going to initially in order to seek asylum and the countries down the way are the countries to which they went. The bigger the circle, the more asylum seekers to that country. Asylum seekers arrived at last in Western Europe. The world awoke, awoke to that news on September 5th, 2015. As refugees previously trapped in Hungary slipped across the Austrian border to going to Germany. These asylum seekers were from Syria, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Iraq, and other countries. Angela Merkel made clear German intentions to take up to 800,000 asylum seekers. And Sweden, Canada, the UK, and other governments said they planned to offer help as well. Let's look at the next slide. These show the, uh, both the arrivals and the deaths in the major countries of destination. I won't go over them, but the, the over a, thou, a million people arrived in 2015. The next chart. Here are the number of people who drowned in 2015. The Central Mediterranean, 2,892, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Western. A grand total of almost 4,000 people drowned last year. Italy was the top transit country for migrants trying aiming for Europe until August 2015. That distinction then shifted to Greece, the country least able to afford them. The northeastern Greek island of Lesbo has become the most popular gateway to, Euro to the European Union and has been called a 21st century Ellis Island. Of the nearly 1.1 million who arrived in Europe by sea in 2015, 800,000 came through the Greek islands and half of them came through Lesbo. The Greek and Italian Coast Guard performed miracles. They saved many endangered people from drowning. The Italians, for example, reported on only one day in July 2015 rescuing 1,700 people but finding five drowned children in the bottom of a rubber boat. Similarly, nightly attempts by large groups of migrants to force their way through the rail tunnel linking France and Britain provoked anger and severely disrupted the flow of goods and people. After tougher security measures were installed, Calais became yet another flashpoint. This all happened as the EU desperately sought to reform refugee strategies and agreements. More than three million asylum seekers may arrive in Europe in 2016. That's an EU projection. This would make it the largest humanitarian crisis in Europe since World War II. As you can see on this chart how the movements have remained low for many years, starting to pick up in 14, 15, and if this is true, 3 million this year. These reports demonstrate that global humanitarian problems and political conflicts are spiraling out of control. They lay bare yet another equally serious concern. Solution strategies have not kept pace. Let's look at some of the consequences of this slide. Just remember that behind all these massive statistics that I just quoted to you are people, individuals fleeing for safety. The world viewed with horror the news photos of the lifeless body of three-year-old Arlen Curdy, who perished at a beach in Greece in early September 2015. We were forced to confront the frightening reality that his death was yet another tragic example 
of inaction by the international community. Ilan, his mother Ayan, and his four-year-old brother Galad drowned on the short sea crossing between Turkey and Greece. They had fled their home in Kobani, Syria with their father Abdullah. Kobani had been devastated by four months of intense fighting between Kurdish forces backed by U.S. air power and the Islamic State. Abdullah left Istanbul for Europe because he couldn't afford a family in Turkey. He wanted to find a living wage and his family was to follow. They drowned at the edge of a new life. As the Syrian conflict approached its fifth year, the vast scale of the destruction foisted on that country came clearly into view. As of November 15, 2000, as November last year, some 2.1 million homes have been destroyed. Half the country's hospitals destroyed. More than 7,000 schools destroyed. The future of a generation of, of the Syrians may have been lost. Historic icons have been destroyed. Damage is estimated at a staggering $270 billion as of 2015. And rebuilding could cost more than $300 million. That's 10 times more than we spent on the reconstruction of Iraq. And look what we got from that. And new damage is inflicted daily by Russian, American, Syrian, and opposition bombings and other attacks. The tragic deaths of Ilan Kurdi and his family were just a microcosm of the bigger tragedy that continues throughout Syria. Syria has been devastated. And this is all from a pre-war population of 22.4 million. Six and a half million are displaced within Syria. And many of these people have been forced to move three, four times because of continuing danger and damage in that country. 4.1 million are refugees. That means they've crossed a national boundary and they're in some other country in asylum. 310,000 people have been killed. There are 10.6 million still at home, but in a, in a very dangerous situation. And many of them, barring some improvement, are likely to follow the path of their fellow countrymen. Those in neighboring countries include 1.9 million in Turkey, 1.1 million in Lebanon, which accounts for 25% of Lebanon's population and the remainder are in Jordan, Egypt, and, and Iraq. These devastating results come from delayed humanitarian action over the past few years. Earlier action, I firmly believe, might have prevented this catastrophe. The generous spirit of earlier days that led to humanitarian solutions, such as in Indochina, has been slipping from our collective grasp. Solutions generally hostile to refugees and migrants have gained steam. Pope Francis has said that those who close their door to migrants seeking protection should ask forgiveness from God. The divisive issue of religion had entered the dialogue earlier when the Hungarian Prime Minister warned Europe against taking in or allowing in mostly Muslim families. And other leaders were retorting that Christian values demanded helping the less fortunate. The U.S. Holocaust Museum issued a report in October of 2015 about religious persecution carried out by the Islamic State the report found crimes against many ethnic groups 
But crimes against one particular group, the Yazidis, they said, constituted genocide. The Yazidis are followers of a 4,000-year-old faith that draws upon various religions. Their community of about 500,000 in northern Iraq has long faced persecution. ISIS trapped thousands of fleeing Yazidis on a place called Mount Sinjar in Iraq, and many hundreds and thousands died of starvation and dehydration. Eventually, they were rescued by a Kurdish force backed by a U.S.-led coalition against the Is Islamic State in Sinjar. But they remain in grave condition, especially many, many women still held captive. Why was humanitarian action delayed? On many occasions, I've been asked why the international community delayed action in the, on the Middle East, particularly during years 2013 to 15 when corrective actions could have been taken. Many experts say the plight of Syrians was allowed to worsen to avoid upsetting the nuclear negotiations with Iran. According to David Ignatius of the Washington Post, who said, Obama has had the slows in Syria, in part because he didn't want to confront Iran's proxy force there, which is the Lebanese Hezbollah militia, and also Russia, and risk blowing up the nuclear talks. They did not want to rock the boat. The Western governments in Russia stated they were willing to take a huge gamble to stop Iran's destabilizing nuclear ambitions because, as President Obama said, the only real alternative to the deal was war. As expected, opposition to the deal emerged immediately, with some critics arguing that, to the contrary, the deal almost guarantees war. Many compared these negotiations with Reagan's nuclear disarmament talks with the Soviets in the 1980s. One American critic maintains that the history of US, USSR nuclear negotiations in the 1970s and 80s revealed that neither the strategic arms limitation treaties, that SALT I or SALT II, led to war. Although the Soviets used SALT I to expand their nuclear stockpile, and the Senate refused to ratify SALT II. I'm familiar with these because I was supporting Secretary Schultz in the, mid, in the 1980s when he was undertaking these negotiations with the Soviet Union. Time and vigilance will reveal if the current Iraq agreement leads to war or peace. The Obama administration secured enough Senate votes to avoid defeat of the Iran deal, and it came into effect in mid-January. The administration hailed this agreement as its signature foreign policy accomplishment. Michael Gerson of the Washington Post spoke for the deal's opponents when he called it Obama's biggest failure. Now let's look at how the international community is trying to address this crisis. I mentioned to you before, you've got the normal asylum countries, the five of them, Turkey, Jordan, uh, Iraq, Greece, uh, or Egypt, and Lebanon. What the UN has done, it confines its work on those in asylum. It can't deal with people who've on their own initiative fled for political asylum in countries like Germany. So this chart shows the UN's effort to program and raise money for it. And you can see here the various sectors that are involved, and that's what you would expect. Protection, food security, education, health and nutrition, basic needs, shelter, water, social cohesion. Now, I won't bore you with all these numbers, but in the middle, this has been the total requirement since 2011. It amounts to some $15 billion. And the dark colored in each area, that's how much has been funded. The white 
is unfunded. So about 40% has been funded. Over here on the far right, in those same categories, you can see 2015 and the same for 2016. The dark indicates the portion that's been funded. The white indicates the portion that's unfunded. Again, right today, about 40% has been funded. Today it's, and today it's important. I want to look at this chart. I talked about the five asylum governments. This is where the UN is concentrating its effort. That's all it's supporting. You can see in the dark what's funded, the light, what's unfunded. So these are countries trying to help four million refugees with very limited funding. Today, it is especially important to shore up the asylum system in the Middle East. As the welcoming spirit in Germany and other Western European countries is wearing thin. In Germany, Angela Merkel won a standing ovation at a recent meeting of her Christian Democratic Union by declaring, we want to and we will palpably reduce the number of refugees because it's in everyone's interest. Germany is now discussing measures that could result in a less welcoming policy in 2016, including ex expedited deportations for those deemed unworthy of asylum and more hur hurdles for those who have resettled in Germany and want to bring over their families. Even Sweden, who's taken in more asylum seekers on a per capita basis than any other European country, that has the center-left government that's now deploying new border control measures and slashing benefits to send an unmistakable message to refugees. Don't come. Syria now, uh, Sweden, by the way, has presently about 160,000 asylum seekers that have filed asylum claims in that country. And they reported last week that they expect to approve no more than half of those. It is understandable that the sense of lost controls has fueled reactionary sentiments, as have worrisome reports from investigators that at least three of the attackers in the November 13 assault on Paris traveled the same path the re today's refugees are taking. What is America doing? This is a technical chart, but let me explain it. Each year, 2009 to 2015, you see two lines. The light line is what the administration has negotiated with the Congress as th they call the refugee ceiling. It's the maximum numbers they could take in. The dark lines show the actual numbers of people that have arrived. Since the crisis began in, in March 2011, the U.S. has provided $4.5 billion for multilateral refugee relief programs, making it by far the largest in that same period, 2011 to 15. They had authority to take in about 325,000. But within that worldwide target, we took in 2,350. In October 2015, President Obama has directed the U.S. government to accept at least 10,000 this year. Uh, within a worldwide ceiling, again, of 70,000. That would be a big increase over 2000, uh, the previous year, but not very much. The proposal was limited by time-consuming screening procedures, which take from 18 to 24 months to, in order to assure that no radical elements or extremists are admitted to the United States. Congressional reaction has been mixed. In September last year, Secretary Kerry announced the U.S. would further increase its global ceiling, and you don't see it here for 2016, but to increase it in 2016 to 85,000, and to further increase it in the next year to 100,000. These ceiling increases would be devoted primarily to Syria and other Middle Eastern countries. 
The Republican House Led of Representatives approved a measure calling for the personal approval by the heads of the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the CIA, guaranteeing that no terrorists would be entered, be allowed to enter the U.S. before they could be approved. This measure passed the House but failed in the Senate, which is through congressional trickery. But uh, the measure has been, uh, has been uh, defeated. Proposals to bar all Muslims from entering the U.S. or to pause or end the Syrian refugee admissions program have turned the U U.S. responses to Syrians into a hot-button political issue. And it has led to discrimination against Muslims in many parts of this country. I personally am hopeful that more and more voices will rise to denounce these negative and harmful developments. Sadly, the strong advocacy voices of previous years that had helped explain and gain public support for sensitive humanitarian concerns has gone silent. But there are some rays of hope. President Obama announced on December 31, or December 16, rather, that the U.S. would host a summit on the Syrian migrant crisis, which is to take place in New York of next year. Uh, and on January 22nd, Secretary Kerry announced that the U.S. plans to increase its humanitarian aid for Syria by 30%. Given that we're almost five years into this crisis, where do we go from here? The UN, the, uh, there's a group called the Syria Support Group. They've been meeting uh, to try to look at the next way forward, and they proposed that uh, there be a UN resolution calling for a peace conference and a peace process uh, for Syria. That uh, effort uh, did materi materialize into a UN resolution of uh, January 25, uh, uh, early January, and it approved a, res a peace process beginning January 25, which is said to end the Syrian civil war and allow the international community to focus on defeating the Islamic State. The resolution calls for negotiations between the Syrian government and the opposition to set up a transition government that will write a new constitution that will hold elections within 18 months. The status of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is left unclear, as is the designation of terrorist groups to be left out of the discussion. So the first meeting, January 25, was canceled because nobody came. It was then delayed to the end of January. A good friend of mine, uh, Stefan de Mistura, who's been named as the UN's envoy to Syria, is to act as host for these meetings. Um, he called for another meeting just the end of last week and the Syrian government came. The opposition forces said they were not yet prepared to meet with the government. So uh, Stefan is to function as an emissary, going between camps, talking to the Syrian government, talking to the opposition, carrying messages back and forth, trying to come to some kind of a path forward. Uh, he's in a dicey position. But he is a very, very accomplished diplomat and humanitarian uh, official. And I have great confidence, if there is a path forward, that he's likely to find it. I say similarly, there was a Rome agreement last December that endorsed a similar peace uh, ceasefire process for Libya and called for a national unity government there. Diplomats said they did not want Libya to become another Syria. 
taken advantage of these encouraging developments, I believe the elements are being put in place to construct a solution-oriented strategy for the Syrian crisis, just as we did years ago for the Indochina crisis, using the same tested and proven humanitarian principles. And those are, in sequential order, safe asylum first, protection second, and then solutions. We used those in Indochina and over a 20-year period brought the most destabilizing conflict of that region to a solution. Now we're seeing Vietnam, the major protagonist, is in the TPP. Uh, Secretary Kerry was just in Cambodia preparing for this month's ASEAN meeting in California. It's the fastest growing economy in Asia. Laos is progressing in magic leaps and bounds. So that formula works. It's been proven. In Syria, we have seen a, a turn of that solution scenario on its head. The first element they're going for is solutions. Well, that won't work. I visited there and I can see the evidence of it. You can see that Germany is backed up. Sweden's backed up. It's designed not to work. And so I've suggested we call it back and that we emphasize the things that have worked. Let's guarantee asylum in the five asylum countries. Let's have protected no-fly zones where people can stay there safely. For those already in Europe, there's not much we can do except to try to see who will get asylum and who won't. Those who won't get asylum will be returned. Perhaps if we had safe, protected asylum zones, they could come back there. It's unlikely many of them will be able to go back to Syria. But I think the elements of a solution are falling into place if we have someone who can strategize as we had during the Indochina crisis to see the bigger picture, to bring the parties together, and to find agreement. The current difficulties lead me to recall the essential lessons that governments have learned over the years from bitter experience that to succeed it is necessary to place crisis victims at the center of political decision-making from the beginning or else risk losing the momentum to guide the crisis safely through its successive and conflictive stages toward humane outcomes. In other words, if governments delay putting protective arrangements in place, as has happened in Syria, they may find that panicky victims have fled and scattered in many directions. Once that barn door has been forced open, helping governments then have no choice but to play catch up with widely dispersed people. Solution options are then far more elusive, dangerous, expensive, and uncertain. Clearly, the international community and the United States has a lot of corrective work to do. In the final analysis, the only way to stop the tide of refugees is to end the war. Helping governments, including Europe and the United States, should not succumb to rising xenophobia while we're doing that. As long as the Syrian civil war continues, the refugees will keep coming and no government can or should attempt to seal themselves off. Ending the war should be the focus of European and U.S. foreign policy decision-making in 2016. Let me give you a real example of putting victims at the center of foreign policy decision-making. I mentioned I worked with Secretary Schultz during his bargaining with the Soviet Union in the mid-1980s on three important elements, arms control, trade, and human rights. Human rights were the group that fell under my responsibility. That had to do with the Soviet Jewish population, which had for years been trapped by the harsh Soviet government, unable to move between locations, unable to leave the country, 
denied opportunity. Uh, they were pawns the Soviet Union used in its bargaining with the U.S. So in these negotiations, we're dealing with arms control, trade, and human rights. Those are big issues, considering the bargaining is going on between the world's two major superpowers. At one point, after the second summit, Mr. Gorbachev tried to make an offer a compromise. If Mr. Reagan would go slow on human rights, he would accelerate trade and arms control. Seems like an attractive bargain. Turns out Mr. Reagan was an advocate for human rights. So he, did, he left it up to his Secretary of State to offer a response to Mr. Gorbachev. And uh, as preparation for the next summit meeting, Secretary Schultz attended a meeting of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, the CSCE, in Vienna. And he used that occasion to offer these words. Until there is substantial progress in the vital area of human rights, advances in other areas of the relationship are bound to be constrained. Token gestures for short-term lowering of barriers will not suffice. Believe me, the message was heard around the world. Soviet Jews were at the center of American foreign policy decision making. And within a year, we reached new agreements on trade, arms control, and over a million Jews escaped the Soviet Union. That's the result of putting these issues squarely in the center of our foreign policy decision making. Regarding the amount of time that uh, state I'm assuming State Department is, is um, saying it will take to vet the refugees uh, 18 to 24 months. Um, I know that it takes approximately six months to obtain a secret clearance for the background investigation. Mm -hmm. And I know that it takes approximately a year for a top secret clearance, or at least it used to when I got mine. So I, I personally can't imagine what would take 24 months other than the obvious answer, which is they're just stalling. What's your opinion? Well, um, we had 9-11. Um, following that, we have, uh, we've developed a certain bit of suspicion about people coming from that part of the world. Uh, we, don't want, we don't want any more terrorists coming into our country. So the, what's happened now is the, um, a screening regime has been put in place. In fact, we now have, in, out, if you go out to Turkey or, or Jordan, you'll find that with any Syrian out there, we can do an iris scan now. We're beginning to use sophisticated technology to try to find out where people were, what their backgrounds were. We need to find out where these people came from, what their associates were, what kind of interactions they've had. And we got to assure ourselves that we're not letting in another terrorist. Uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the CIA, the State Department now all have a role in uh, trying to ascertain that these are legitimate refugees, that they qualify under our principles and the Con Refugee Convention. Um, state has been able uh, in recent past to clear Syrians within the 24 month time frame. But uh, as I told you, that's produced 2,350 over the past five years. That's not very many. In order to deal with what we see coming down the road, the U.S. effort probably should increase. Uh, so they're putting a lot more resources into all of those investigative agencies. And I think they are using uh, sophisticated technology that we didn't have during my time. And they're able to tell a lot more about people, their backgrounds, their associates, where they came from, past activities. I'm hopeful that they'll be able to detect any future problems. If not, if anybody does slip through, you know, we know that here in this country, uh, the Homeland Security and all the agencies have been able to detect and stop many, many threats over the last years since 2011. 
I'm confident that they're on the job. So I don't think we can any longer use that as an excuse for failing to resettle Middle Eastern refugees. But it's an issue, and I will not minimize it. And we've got to be able to assure ourselves and the American public that we're not bringing in potential bombers. But uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sir, what factors, in your opinion, have caused the current administration to disregard the lessons of our history or the fact that the wheel was already invented uh, for dealing with uh, asylum problems and migration problems? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and I'm afraid I can't answer because I've asked the same thing. Uh, I had a meeting recently involving the Deputy Secretary of State, and I tell him the model is there. It was developed many years ago, and it's proven to work. Uh, but I do think that uh, other matters, important matters, which I won't attempt to d diminish or minimize, uh, have been calling for attention uh, of this government and this administration. The Iran nuclear deal they put as a number one priority. And uh, they were not going to do anything that would upset the Iranians, uh, the Iranian government, or the Russian government, who's also supporting uh, Iran. Uh, they had to balance off these big power interests. So I, I, I can't answer your question. I can only say I think they were preoccupied with other critically important matters. I do think the issue now is on their radar screen. They, I think they now recognize the actions that were taken earlier to solve similar complex issues are still there. Uh, the fact that almost two days after I met with the State Department, they issued these new initiatives regarding a substantial 30 percent increase in funding, calling for a migrant uh, meeting at the UN next year, and uh, taking similar other measures. I think they're listening. And I don't want to discourage or diminish what is happening. But I think uh, as a matter of so many balls in the air, that one didn't get attention. Do politics really stop at the water's edge? And will not the current political campaign inordinately delay any meaningful progress on this refugee situation? Well, Roy, it certainly isn't going to help. When you've got... Uh, when you've got campaigners who are on the, on the fringe of, of uh, I, I don't know what word to describe it, but destructive action, uh, trying to convince the American public that these people that we're trying to help are all enemies, are all threats, are all dangerous, uh, that's not going to help. Uh, what I'm hoping is that other campaigners or other politicians who are in this race will add a bit of sanity to this discussion. And I'm hopeful that it, it will encourage more and more people like us to stand up and to speak out. I will tell you, when I was uh, in charge of this back in the 80s and also when I was at IOM uh, through the 90s, there was a very active advocacy network in this country. If I made a wrong move on Cambodians, I could expect Steve Solars on my neck the next day. I could expect the NGOs, the Church World Service, the International Rescue Committee to be flooding us with letters and calls. I could expect church groups to oppose. I could hear speeches. Uh, and they influenced me. I listened. I thought they played a very important role, although generally we were not in agreement to start with. But we need an advocacy community. We need people like you and me to speak up and to say that we want our government to perform its usual humanitarian role toward these people uh, who are in despair and to downplay these idiotic statements that we're hearing. So I, I think the campaign, Roy, doesn't help, but I think it provides us an opportunity if we'll seize it. I, I thought I saw on one of your slides that you quoted C. 
60 million refugees. So is that 56 million in addition to the 4 million in Syria? I mean, no, no, this, this figure is produced by the UN. Oh. Okay, and you might get back to that slide, Gene, if it's possible. But this is a calculation that includes refugees, uh, internally displaced persons. These are refugees, internally displaced persons, and people at risk in their own countries. The UN tries to keep track of those. Uh, and you can see here, during my day, uh, normally have 14, 15 million refugees, maybe that many displaced persons, and others uh, under siege in their own countries. But that's the UN's figure. We've never reached before that level in this country since World War II. You might remember in World War II, we had hundreds of thousands of, in, of displaced persons, and the U.S. played a very important role in helping to relieve that problem. But this is frightening. Uh, this is what's caused Antonio Guterres and other UN leaders to say that they don't have either the funding, the staffing, or the capacity to deal with these problems. They're destabilizing governments all over the world. That 60 million in that category is, uh, is very difficult. And it's a major, major problem. And uh, it's going to challenge the international community and the national governments who choose to be engaged. Thank you, sir, for coming and sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and insights with us. We deeply appreciate it. So what individual human beings, individual citizens like us can do, and if there is an organization that you think is trustworthy, who is willing to go and help needed human being, not the color, the shape, size, or the faith, but the human beings are in trouble and need help. Whose organization is that that you can trust to help? Well, I think there's a very active role for people like you and me. Uh, we can let our voices be heard. Uh, we know there are many organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, that are really doing enormous work. I saw them all on my trips to the Middle East. We can support them. We can, they can be our emissaries to helping people in those uh, camps and situations uh, scattered throughout the Middle East. Uh, we can uh, let the government know that if we ever, if it ever does choose to try to help resettle other refugees, that we're willing to be participants. We're willing to help those people get assimilated into our communities. We're willing to ease their assimilation into our society. And I think we, we just have to let the world know that we don't accept what's going on now. And it must be changed. And regardless, you know, as a signatory to the UN uh, Refugee Convention, which was signed in 1951, and to which the United States is a signatory, we oblige ourselves to go to the aid of refugees who are persecuted, because of their race, religion, their nationality, their economic opinion, or their membership in a particular social order that causes them to be discriminated and to have to leave their country. That's our obligation. Uh, in my view, that's a serious obligation, and it doesn't allow us to discriminate by re religion or race. Uh, we treat them all the same, and I hope that our government will do that. And I thank you for that very thoughtful question. Um, last night you said that placing immigrants directly into their country of final destination is counterproductive to a solution strategy. I assume this is because it skips the screening process. I was wondering what would be a more useful solution strategy? Well, one of the reasons that we follow the pattern that I mentioned, asylum, protection, and solution, is because in asylum, we have an opportunity to inter interview that person, to get to know them, to find out the proper solution for them, to work with countries that might receive them, to see if they're prepared. And then once that deal is struck, to facilitate their, their solution. One, if you decide, for instance, that you want to go straight from Syria 
to Germany. Nobody's looked at you. There's no protection regime available for you. There's no place for you to spend the night. So you get into Germany, they're not prepared for you. So 1.1 million of you congregate in Germany in cities that don't have the wherewithal. Uh, it produces chaos. It leads to decisions like uh, Mrs. Merkel has had to reach. We're going to cut off aid and some support that we had been providing to asylum seekers in Germany. It causes Denmark, for instance, we heard last night, to pass laws that say we're going to take whatever resources these incoming asylum seekers have except for $1,500. Well, you know, that's an outrageous policy. And gover it forces governments to reach for straws. Uh, so I think a much better solution would be for us to establish a protected, uh, protected zone in Turkey and in Jordan and in Lebanon and Egypt and if possible in Iraq so that the people needing to flee can go, know they'd be safe, and then from there we pursue solutions for them. It's much safer for them and it's more orderly for us and it gives us a chance to prepare for them. You know, when refugees came to the U.S., uh, and I, as you saw on that chart, I brought in about 800, over 800,000. But I knew that they're coming from another culture, another society. They need to be prepared for life in an industrialized society like the United States. So I established a camp in the Philippines, Bataan Island. And for every refugee that came to the United States, I put them through six months of English language training, cultural orientation, some skills training for the kids, some coursework. Uh, and we began to link up the refugee with his partner where it was going to be resettled. People from the states came to get to know them. They got to know Americans. By the time they landed in America, they hit the ground running. And that's what I think we got to be working toward, that we can make refugees coming to our societies, prosperous members of our society from the day one. But I think there are many ways we can do other than having people go directly to their pre-selected solution country. Uh, I've never seen it to work and I don't think it's going to work in the Middle East or in Europe. Again, thank you, sir, for coming today and uh, delivering so much important information. I just have a question. It relates to so, many, so much of the information on your slides about how different the situation is these days, how some of these numbers are at a tipping point. Um, do you have any guesstimate or um, you know, facts or figures maybe in terms of how many people are projected to return to Syria? If about 4 million out of 20 million have left. Uh, and at what time frame? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, that's a very good question. And I did raise that with the... NGOs and the governments in the Middle East who are also concerned with that topic. Obviously, today, nobody's going to return. In the midst of a war and chaos, a destroyed country that who knows when will be rebuilt. Uh, it's unlikely. I suspect it's probably unlikely in the near future. But if we can bring this war to an end, if we can stop the barrel bombing, if we can get the Russians out, if we can get the opposition from not attacking, if we can get Bashar al-Assad out of power, uh, then a lot of things become possible.